I could see a huge, ugly first quarter. I could see a repeat of 2021 of a first quarter where the market just went straight down. And I could see that after this is all over, especially depending on how this year closes out. If we continue to rally similar to the pace we're rallying now, I would probably on December 30th or 31st, take a big short position and gamble going into the first of the year. Fan favorite Todd Bubba Horowitz is back. He's a veteran trader that will be breaking down markets with us today. Why is it that stocks rallied the way they did over the last four weeks? And can this momentum continue? Let's find out. First, a word from our sponsor today, iTrust Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets. iTrust offers 1% trading fees, the lowest in the crypto IRA space. So if you're over 18, want to open a new account or roll over an existing account with cash, click on itrust.capital slash David to learn more and get started. Todd, welcome back to the show. Always good to see you. David, it's great to be with you. As always, you are one of the best in the business. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Todd, you were on the show two months ago. Great interview. I'm going to put the link in the description. People can check out. You gave a longer term and medium term market outlook and your macro outlook. I want to recap uh, some of the points you talked about. You were saying uh, there's a possibility for a, a further decline in the stock markets we're, we're seeing you're talking about 50 to 70% decline from its highs uh, from last year. Now, a lot of that has already happened. We've Throughout the summer, the stock markets have continued to decline. However, in the last, I would say, four weeks, it just went up like in a straight line. I'm talking about the S&P 500. How are you reading that? What happened there? Well, you know, first of all, the, the fourth quarter, David, is the most bullish quarter of the year as a rule. You know, again, obviously it's not always seasonal, but it, we call it the Santa Claus rally. And of course, when you catch a lot of people short at the same time into a bullish time of year, when the shorts run out of, of bullets, as far as being able to push it further or lower, you get these dramatic rallies. And basically you've had a parabolic move for about the last three weeks that has run us straight up to the tops bringing in the potential that the NASDAQ could possibly reach all-time new highs. You still remember that you're only driving these markets on a couple of stocks. This is not a broad-based rally. This is very narrow in both the NASDAQ and the S&P. And certainly, I would not be surprised to see this rally continue a little bit through uh, the end of the year. Again, it is a more bullish time of the year. The only year I can remember was 2018, where we had the Black Christmas. So the rally is, is not surprising. I still stand by, I think we're going down 50 to 70% at some point before it's all said and done. I think this action will actually make it easier because I don't believe that this is all that bullish of a rally. It's nice to have it, but it's on amazingly light volume. It is really very thin right now. And there's a big lack of participation into this rally. Well, you know, the, uh, the mid caps and small caps, the Russell 2000 also saw a rally, not to the same extent as the S&P 500. It's not up back to July highs, but had a bit of a bounce as well. Uh, so you're right. Maybe it's maybe it's all markets. Um, has this been affected by the move in the yields? Was this an impact? I think it might have something to do. I do believe that many believe that the Fed is through hiking, and I do, I do not believe that. I don't believe that they're going to get to their 2% inflation target, which is total BS to begin with. I don't think they can be done hiking. And of course, many of the Fed presidents throughout the country have also stated that they're not sure that they're through yet. You know, I, I think the imbalance here is the Fed itself and the repo rate and, of course, what's going on with the overall banks. I mean, we, we've never had this many banks at the emergency lending window to borrow from the Federal Reserve, which just tells us how over leveraged everything is. And I think the Fed's trying to thread the needle here, but they, they can't see. So they could never thread the needle because they don't understand that free markets should be determining what the rates are, not the Federal Reserve. OK, you said that you don't think the Fed's done hiking. Why not? Because again, they're far away from their 2% inflation target. And I, I think that we're, we're in very big danger of stagflation, which would con be consistent with them hiking rates even further. I mean, we're, we're getting back to ready to go back into the potential Jimmy Carter era. Oh, okay. Refresh this, please. What happened during the Jimmy Carter era? Stagflation, extremely high interest rates, CD rates were like 13, 14%. Mortgage rates were in the sky. There is no movement in stagflation. There is, it, it is worse than deflation. It is worse than inflation. It is by far nothing happens. It kind of sits in the standstill. So you're talking about late 70s, early 80s. You know what else happened during that time is a huge shock in the oil market. Obviously, that was OPEC specific. 
not exactly what's happening now, but walk us through your thesis about energy. How do you see the energy markets playing out in that context? Well, the the, the low prices in energy, the sell-off in crude oil recently. Now, again, let's, let's go back to about a month ago, right before the, the Mideast crisis. You had crude oil at $95 a barrel. It then dropped significantly. Then you had the Mideast crisis that pushed it back to 85 Now we're in the 70s. I think that you're going to see Saudi Arabia and, and Russia continue to cut production. I think that OPEC's going to continue to cut, and they're going to get those prices back higher again. You know, oil is a very important tool to what we do and to what we use. And and the the fact that we're lower prices only means that Saudi Arabia and Aramco and OPEC are going to lower price, lower production to raise prices higher. Now, the inflation that you're talking about, is that um, is that predicated on your oil outlook? In other words, do you think oil is going to go up much, much higher, therefore keeping inflation elevated? Or is inflation just its own thing completely detached from the energy market right now? Well, I don't. Th I think energy's got a part of it, of course. I mean, but again, the the backwards theory in which the government uses to calculate inflation is not reality because the number one and two cost for the average family is food and energy. Now, again, if you have other costs, yes. If there's an emergency, yes. Those inflation numbers may have fallen, but overall, food and energy are something we use every single day, and they're not too volatile. For, to be counted for because they are direct money out of the consumer's pocket. And again, oil is still high. Remember, oil is still up 53% from, from when Biden took office. So at the end of the day, we're still 53% higher in oil. We're still 20% higher in groceries. And the average income is down about $7,000 a year. Okay. So bottom line is um, uh, Americans are still going to uh, suffer from inflation for the foreseeable future. That's your view. I think so, yes. Okay, so let's turn back to the market. So, like we talked about, uh, huge, um, huge rally last quarter is usually <laughs> historically been good for the markets. How are you trading this right now? Are you are you are you seeing this right now? And you are you going to ride the momentum until the end of the quarter? Are you going to short it from because it's gone up a lot already? Or are you just going to leave it? Uh, well, no, actually, I'm long the markets here. I mean, again, I'm going to play. I have an algorithm, and I'm going to play what that tells me. The trend is up. I'm not going to remember. You don't fight the trend. When you're in markets, you have to let the trends play out. And again, you're not going to sell the top. You're not going to buy the bottom. When the trend turns over, and it, right now it shows no appearances of turning over. I mean, certainly we're seeing a little bit of selling today, but at the end of the day, you would expect a little bit of selling. I mean, markets cannot go up at a 90 degree angle and expect to be sustained and hold those levels. We got the big squeeze out of the shorts. So you will start to see either markets will start to flatten sideways and start to consolidate or you will start to see a drop. And when the trend changes, I am more than anxious to get short here. I'm not gonna try to out jump it. There's a few small things I will do to get short. I'll sell some option premium up at resistance, but overall, I'm gonna let the trend play out. And I know that this is a bullish time of the year. And I know that the next three days, for example, there's a holiday, there's a lot less volume going on. There's no reason for me to step in front of the train as it's running over my face. Uh, <laughs> you get. <laughs> That's a very vivid image, Todd. At what point is this train going to stop? At what point do you look at economic data and say to yourself, okay, here's a here's a piece of statistic or here's a number that came out. I think that train's going to hit a wall. Well, I mean, there's so many things that come out and the news itself really won't be it. What it'll be is that the consumers will finally wake up and realize that, you know what, I'm out of money. I mean, there's you do realize that this is a record number of amount of people in credit card debt up to their limit. It's not the dollar amount that's important because, you know, dollars change from year to year. But the record amount of people are, are limit out on at least one of their credit cards. At some point, they got to stop spending. And you've already seen with Lowe's and Best Buy, their earnings coming out, they've missed on their earnings coming out. So this becomes a problem with the consumer. You're starting to see a lot of these little things. Now, markets don't just turn over overnight. If you go back to the last collapse, which is 07, 08, the news, you could see it turning in 07 and 08 before it ever hit. But at the end of the day, until the buyers evaporate and until the people realize that they have no more money left, that's what's going to happen. And I think the participation here is really more of a retail rally. The, the commercials, the big traders are on the sidelines waiting to hammer this market. And it'll announce itself when it comes, but you'll have to wait and be patient. So you're basically, I think you're saying that uh, once earnings season comes in for Q1, maybe Q2 next year, when things start slowing down, that's when we see a turn in the tides. I could see 
a huge, ugly first quarter. I could see a repeat of 2021 of a first quarter where the market just went straight down. And I could see that after this is all over, especially depending on how this year closes out. If we continue to rally similar to the pace we're rallying now, I would probably on December 30 or the 31st, take a big short position and gamble going into the first of the year. Well, in 2000, uh, 2000 and 2001, when we had the dot-com uh, bust uh, or boom, um, it, it basically happened. Uh, well, there was a boom and then a bust. What happened was uh, all the tech stocks within the NASDAQ, um, you know, uh, the music stopped for them. <laughs> What's the catalyst this time? <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be similar. I mean, again, a lot of these companies are well overvalued. A lot of the valuations are crazy. A lot of them don't even make money yet, but yet you continue to see them bought. I mean, listen, that was March of 2001 when the when the big sell-off started. And again, it, it doesn't announce itself, but we're not making money the way I can see it. Jobs are horrible. The, the entire environment is horrible. The economy is in bad shape. You've got uh, China coming in here without firing a shot. They're taking over the United States bit, bit by bit. OK, and so at the end of the day, none of this adds up to a positive outcome or a positive outlook going forward. The unemployment rate came in a couple of weeks ago at 3.9%. This is early November. Uh, their monthly report uh, indicated that this is the highest level of unemployment in uh, many months. Um, you know, as a trader, you look at this number. Do you do you think to yourself, okay, it's time to do something about it? Clearly, the markets either ignored it or thought it was good news for some reason because you know what happened throughout November. Markets kept going up. Well, I mean, the markets are are very much more interest rate sensitive than they are job sensitive. Let's face it. The money that's being invested is money that is either coming from 401ks or IRAs or or whatever from the retail investor. And they don't look at the rest of the data. They, listen, the, the data doesn't have to be in effect today. OK, this will play out over time and it will get ugly over time because we're going to realize that people aren't working. It means that it's going to slow supply down, leading us more into that stagflationary territory that I'm talking about. And things are going to melt down. I mean, again, the liquidity in the bond market is drying up. We saw the 10 year notes hit 5 percent and fall like a stone. We're going to see all these problems will come to bear. But we cannot predict when they will come, but they will show up and they will give the average investor plenty of warning signals and plenty of time to get out if they choose to. But unfortunately, most investors say, well, no, this is just another dip, another chance to buy and, and don't get out. And of course, then it becomes too late when they finally all try to get to the exit at the same time. By the way, the, uh, the speaking of the 10 year, you, you mentioned earlier, it's been coming down ever since the uh, beginning of November. Uh, wh wh what's that reaction to? That's just is that just the market thinking the rate hikes are over or is something else? Well, I think it's part of that. I mean, the first thing is it hit, it hit over 5 percent within the first time forever. Right. So that was a reason to sell just as a trader. Now, again, with the rates holding and without the Fed raising the last couple of times, that also has pushed it down. But if you really look at the yield curve, David, You've got bills, treasury bills are paying five and a half percent. Ten year money is four and a half percent, and 30-year money is four and a half percent. Think about the inversion of the yield curve, which is not a bullish sign either. I, I heard this from an economist the other day I was talking to. Uh he said that bonds are gonna enter a multi-year, perhaps um a long cycle of bearishness. Basically, he doesn't think yields are gonna come down significantly anytime soon, which is gonna be bad for the 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 the, 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 uh, the nominal value of the bond of course uh how do you feel about that would you be trading uh bonds uh with the bearish attitude for the foreseeable future i would be selling the bond future which indicates that interest rates are going higher that's the way that i will be playing it uh as it, as it sits today though as it sits right this moment just to give you a full disclosure i'm long bonds right now the 10 and the 30 but and i'm playing them as a trade based on where the trend is right now. But if you told me, put on a position on based on interest rates, if you don't understand, bond futures go down when interest rates go up and vice versa. I would be a seller of bond futures. And as soon as this trade concludes, I will be a seller of bond futures and notes. How do you feel about buying treasuries as a cash equivalent and just collecting coupons on the yield? I think if you're getting enough, I mean, if you're buying T-bills at five and a half percent, I think that's great. I mean, I have I have a lot of money in and CDs at five and a half percent. So I have no problem with that. I Listen, a five and a half percent yield is, is bigger than the dividend paid on the stock market. And you're getting it with zero risk. I mean, you're getting it with guaranteed money okay, versus, you know, the I think the, 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 the exchange now is paying about a two percent dividend based on current pricing. OK, and you have risk to the downside of the stock.
So again, I would think that, you know, for an average investor in these murky times where it could get very crazy, I think five and a half percent is a, is a good place to be. Well, the question that some people might have is how long this could last. Suppose I park my cash in treasuries. I'm giving up the opportunity cost here is something else I could have invested in with higher yield, but if I'm getting five and a half percent forever. That's pretty good. Am I going to get it forever? You're not going to get it forever. You might get more, you might get less. But remember, if you take T-bills, which are, it's going to be three months or monthly bills, or you take CDs at three months, you're not giving up the opportunity cost. Your time horizon as an investor is never three months. Your time horizon as an investor is years. So if you miss the initial move, remember, timing the market is for fools. OK, you can't time it. You have to let you have to be in the market to win it. You have to understand what you're trying to do. But trying to time the exact movement of when it's going to happen you're going to go broke first before you ever time it right. What's the uh, how's the uh, real estate market doing over there? Where I think you're in Vegas right now. Is that is, I'm in Vegas right now. I think it's you know mediocre. Um, you know prices have come down. Uh, you know certainly the building is slowed, uh, but I, I, there still is some demand, and you're seeing a little bit. But I, again, I think housing's in big trouble too. I mean, out here, you have to qualify for an eight percent mortgage. Okay, I cried when I had to pay three and a quarter for a mortgage. Now it's eight. So again. To me, none of the signs are pointing to something that's really good in the, on, on the horizon. Suppose you are a, a real estate investor. Uh, is now a good time to sell? Uh, or should you wait for rates to come down before you sell? If you're, if you're holding, if you're an investor in real estate, you know, and you're renting out your properties, <clears throat> I don't see any reason to sell. Uh, I think that if you're if you're looking to turn a quick buck, I think it's a great time to sell, especially with Blackstone, you know, still involved buying up, you know, because a lot of the commercial real estate, one of the reasons prices have held high is places like Blackstone have not bought a lot of commercial real estate all in the interest of helping the American consumer, which is all bullshit. Oops. But uh, it's it's something that, you know, is 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 a, is a fallacy. So I think that, you know, we have to be aware of that. But if you're selling it because you need the money or selling because you intended to sell it, I think now's a great time to sell. If you're getting rent and you're not intending to sell, I would hold it. Um, I want to uh, close off on commodities. But before that, asset allocation then, uh, you know, suppose you were to allocate a, some amount of money to a portfolio. Uh, what would you do? What percentage cash? What percentage stocks? What percentage real estate? If you want to hold real estate, Oh, how, how would you play this? Well, first of all, personally, I'm always hedged. So I'm always pretty much almost 100% in as much as I'm going to commit to the market uh, from my hedging standpoint, because I'm protected. But the average person, I would say, you know, right now, I'd be probably 50% in equities. I'd probably be 35 to 40% in CDs and 10 to 15% in precious metals. That would be how I would break it down just in a quick, rapid acid question. Okay, good. You didn't, uh, sorry, did you mention any fixed income there? Uh, well, I, I, I mentioned CDs or, or okay. T-bills, which to me is right. like fixed income at five and a half percent. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, well, let's talk about uh, precious metals then. Good run this year, despite higher interest rates. How do you feel about that argument that higher interest rates usually bring down the price of gold? That hasn't happened this year. Why not? Well, I, I think we have to remember <clears throat> that correlations are not always accurate and okay. correlations are not always immediate. You know, everybody cries when the dollar goes higher. Oh, the commodities are going to go down. Well, that's not necessarily the case because we don't know what the true correlation should be at that time. I think gold looks really strong. I think gold has made a nice run. And I think gold still has a chance to make an all-time new high before the year is over. Uh, and I don't, again, I don't look at the interest rate market comparing it to the gold market because, again, they are two separate markets, although there can be some effect. But we go back to supply versus demand and where the buyers are coming from. And right now, I think you're seeing some pretty good substantial flow into the gold markets. Even China just bought 600 tons of gold. So, I mean, yeah. again, we're seeing those 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 relationships, and we cannot look at correlations on a day-to-day -day basis. You and I spoke before October 5th when gold bottomed. Um, well, after the summer, I mean, it bottomed after the uh, summer high, um, and then it shut up in a straight line. What happened after that? It was it it was it was it mostly because of the war in Israel that uh, drove fears. Well, I think that's the, the excuse being given, but I think what you saw was that gold had gone down and it had gone down and it finally stopped going down. And eventually the shorts got nervous and they had to cover. And once they started to cover, it then created a more bullish tent and a more bullish market. And I think that's what we're seeing now. And I, I, I look for this to continue as we go forward. Okay, so this is short covering. Uh, you wouldn't the, expect the, it. Most rallies, just so everybody understands, most rallies start out of short covering. 
Okay. Right. Because people are trying to weight it down. And once it no longer goes down, it's even when I was a floor trader, you'd look around, wait a second, I'm short. The markets aren't going down. They should be. So I start to cover and then everybody covers at the same time. And you get these big, massive rallies. Okay. Um, are there uh, are there, are there uh, uh, ranges that the, 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 the traders are looking for right now? I think eighteen twenty was eighteen hundred is a good psychological floor. Uh, what what's the next level upward that you break this resistance? It goes higher. I think the next level up is going to be probably twenty one hundred okay. that I'd be looking at. Okay, okay. I think you're. I think you watch nineteen hundred, nineteen forty on the downside to twenty sixty to twenty one hundred on the upside. Okay. Suppose suppose um suppose the Fed does hike interest rates again. Like you said, basically, if your if your prediction is right, uh, would that change your outlook on gold? No, if rates nothing will change higher. outlook on gold. Gold is going higher, as far as I'm concerned. It's a it's a it's a good long term asset to hold. You know, hard assets are something that's very good for everybody to own as part of their portfolio, and it may not go up tomorrow, but it will increase in value over time. And again, it's got many values, including the potential need for a currency at some point again. Why is gold at its or near its all-time highs throughout its history, but silver is still 50% away from its highs. Well, you know, silver's move when they had it in in, in 09 was, was ridiculous, okay? That was just like, that was a total short squeeze. Everybody just bought it and kept buying it, and of course, it failed. And of course, this is very, listen, you can compare silver almost to the NASDAQ of the late 90s, 2000, up to 2001. Right. And it took a long time for the NASDAQ to make that big move get back. Silver will catch up at some point. I thought it was going to be more this year. I really thought that silver was going to get over $30. I'm wrong. I'll be quite happy if it gets over $25 this year. But I do think silver is very bullish. And remember, silver's got multiple uses, not just as a, as a decoration or as a currency, but it's got some industrial use. So I do think silver is on, on demand and, and will catch up. It may take a couple of years, but I think it will get back in, in sync with, with gold at the same time. You don't sound as bullish on silver as you did on gold. Am I right? I love silver. I'm just concerned that it, it's been right. so slow. I mean, I, listen, I buy equal weight of everything, and I'm a big fan of silver. I just don't want to create the aura that you right. should be running out to buy silver today because, again, it's, it has had a long road. And if you look at the overall year, it's only had about a $6 range for the entire year, which is ridiculous. I understand. All right. Well, let's uh, turn finally to the uh, soft commodities, the agricultural products. You know, so we... Ordinary citizens like you and me, I want to go to the grocery store. I don't want to see the prices go up anymore. And if you break down the CPI, if you look at the BLS reports every single month, one of the highest items or some of the highest items that go up the most, double digit, I'm talking about double digit inflation, grocery items, things like dairy, nuts, things you buy, uh, even food away from home, uh, restaurants going up uh, high single digits or double digits um, in percentage gains every single year, every single month. When are we going to see prices for food stabilize a little bit? Is that going to happen? I don't think so. I, I think you're, there's a very good chance, in my opinion, that there's going to be a food shortage next year. You know, you you what you've done here is you've got a lot of trouble at the producer level because the producer, the farmer, their rates on and interest rates are extremely high. Fuel costs are high. Everything they do is expensive. And unless they've created a bumper crop this year, they're going to lose money. Now, next year, as they now start planning for next year and pl go for planting season, if everything stays as it is, you could have many farmers not plant next year because they cannot afford to plant at a loss, let alone the banks won't loan them the money to plant at a loss. So you could see a food shortage. I cannot believe the difference between the cost of production where the farmers are selling corn, let's say for 470, and the price at the store. There's a big miss in the middle of course, that's the cost of fuel. That's the cost of everything else to get it to the store. But I could see a shortage in my eyes coming forward. And, and at the end of the day, we'll see what it looks like. But I do think that I'd be a buyer of the grain markets for sure. Uh, you, you live in the States. I live in Canada. Uh, our government, the Trudeau government has proposed, I don't know if they're actually going to do this, but a couple of months ago, they proposed that uh, should grocery stores not do something about high prices, uh, the government will take in uh take further action including taxing them so basically uh they're threatening to tax grocery stores more if they don't either stop maybe if the government would stop taxing the retailer on the cost the prices would come down you know how about that as, as a government let them stop taxing the retailer for retailing it and you know, it's the same as gasoline i mean we're paying tax money on half these goods that is not going to anybody but the government. And if the government would learn how to spend the money, they wouldn't need to keep taxing it.
All right. Okay, final thoughts, uh, Todd. We've got uh, five weeks till the end of the year. What are you most bullish on just until till Christmas? I mean, I'm most bullish on gold. I'm most bullish on, on the grain markets that may take a little bit longer, but I'm very bullish going forward. And you have to stay bullish somewhat equities just because they're going yeah. higher and I can't fight what, what is a traditional history. All right, excellent. Where can we learn more about your work and uh, learn more from you? You can come to BubbaTrading.com, check out the site. You can come to my Monday night call. And of course, last time I gave away my book and I'd be happy to give away copies again if people would like to have it on a on a, on a PDF file. Uh, just to email me at Bubba at BubbaTrading.com. Are you going to write another book soon? Um, probably not. I think my years of writing are over. <laughs> okay. Maybe you should write like a tutorial on, uh, on, on, uh, on, 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 on poker. Thank you very I much. might do that. that. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Integrate that with trading. Thank you very much, Todd. Always Thanks, David. Good. Have a great day. You too. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to follow Todd in the links down below and subscribe.